And good morning, Cybert. <laughs> if you want to take the thing over, just let me know. I mean, you know, whatever, 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 whatever. So, hey, yesterday I took my annual physical exam. You know, the, the homosexual community is working very, very hard. If you're watching movies and television, the homosexual community is working very, very hard to to sell us on the idea that homosexuality is a very natural part of life. But I had my physical exam yesterday. And uh, is that, <laughs> it just reaffirmed to me, I mean, anybody who's ever had a digital prostate examination knows that homosexuality is just not right. I mean, <laughs> it's just not right. Uh, what an unpleasant... I'm scarred. I mean, I am really scarred. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So as I say, then this is the last study in this series. And we've been talking here a little bit about surrender the last few weeks. We talked about how do you have more faith. The big idea that week was that Nothing, past or present, even remotely suggests that God will not keep his word. And that's the foundation upon which we can surrender. And then we talked about how do you get rid of the dreads. And uh, I don't know, does anybody remember the big idea from that, that week, a couple weeks ago, a couple times ago? I must each day come humbly to the foot of the cross and there negotiate the terms of a full surrender. To the Lordship of Jesus. Okay, you, my dear brother, get a gold star. Huh? There you go. There you go. Got a gold star. That's not bad for a former sheriff of Orange County, huh? <laughs> All right, and then the last uh, time we were together, we were talking about... The, the act of surrender and how you go about doing that. And does anybody remember the big idea from that session? Lord, whatever it takes for me to be in right relationship with you, do it. All right, Bob, you get one too. Gold star. I'm going to put this one on your forehead. Do you mind? <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Well, I'm going to start handing out gold stars. It's, it's my new attempt at learning theory. So anyway, I figure it's good enough for elementary school kids. It's probably good enough for you. So, so we uh, did that. And, and, and today what I want to do is I want to... Uh, we talk about what surrender is and, and the active and how you do it. But how do we actually implement surrender? What's the implementation plan? And so today's message, what does surrender look like in practice, what does surrender actually look like in, in practice? And uh, I want to pick, uh, as our starting point this morning, a big challenge. Surrender really seems to come into play. The, the need, the, the feeling that we need to surrender our lives really seems to come into play when we face a big challenge. And so it may be that you have a big deal that... that that you just can't seem to get close. I've talked with two businessmen this week who have big deals that they're having difficulty getting closed. The marketplace is a little different than it was a year ago. I talked to a man this morning, one of our six-figure donors, who uh, I called him to say happy birthday and, and talked in a while. And, and I said, what are you going to be doing today? He said, well, I'm going up to a certain university, state university, to help my son clean out his dorm room and then I'm taking him to a drug rehabilitation center out in Arizona because he has become addicted to cocaine. He's facing a big challenge. We need to we need surrender in our lives most when we're when we're facing a big challenge. So it could be it could be for you. It could be a health issue. It could be a financial security issue, or it could be that she says that you know I just can't take it anymore. I, I just, I'm just sick and tired of having to always tiptoe around you with what I say. And your wife, you know, 10, 15 years of, of pent up, you know, so you, it's a big challenge. Well, what does surrender actually look like in, in practice? 
The opposite of surrender, probably, is when we try to force outcomes. When we try to make it happen. When we try to control another person. Or we try to control the situation. And so this morning we want to look at three things. How the Bible suggests we approach a big challenge. How is letting it happen different from making it happen? And then finally, what is our part and what is God's part in letting it happen? All right, so first, how does the Bible suggest that we approach a big challenge? We're going to be looking at Zechariah chapter 4 this morning, which is found on December 23rd in your Bible. And before we read the text, let me give you the backdrop. As you know, the, the Jews, the Israelites, were unfaithful to God uh, over a long period of time, and, and he exiled them to Babylon for 70 years. But then, because God is always merciful, it's part of his inherent character, he brought the, the Israelites back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, and uh, told them to rebuild the temple. But after 15 years, the temple still lay in ruin. In fact, I was reading in uh, uh, Haley's Bible handbook. If you don't have that, I, it's the, it's, this is the same one I've had since I first decided I want to get serious about being a Christian like 30, 35 years ago. This is the same book. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, that's just so simple. But let me just tell you, there are more interesting facts in Haley's Bible handbook. You can just always put your hand on some tidbit that's useful. And so this is what... This is, I'm just reading from, from the book. The people, uh, 15 years earlier, the foundation of the temple had been laid. In other words, when they came back from the exile, they laid the foundation. But meantime, nothing more had been done. So 15 years, nothing had happened. The people had lost interest in rebuilding the temple. God, speaking through uh, one of the prophets, informs them that this was the reason for their poor crops. They had, they had neglected rebuilding the temple. And, of course, today, you know, we are the body of Christ and, you know, paying attention to our own spiritual life and, and the church. That was the reason that they were having poor crops. That was the reason that they were having their particular big challenge. One of the most insistent Old Testament teachings is that National adversity is due to national disobedience to God. National adversity is due to national disobedience to God. So that's the backdrop here. And so uh, there's a great deal of wonder whether Jerusalem will uh, ever be rebuilt, whether the temple will ever be restored. Uh, the people feel weak and the opposition seems strong. And so, Zechariah gets a vision. It says, The angel who had been talking with me, Zechariah, returned and woke me as though I had been asleep. What do you see now? He asked. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are seven lamps, each having seven spouts with seven wicks. And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I ask the angel, what are these, my Lord? What do they mean? Uh, Don't you know, the angel asked. No, my Lord, he replied. And isn't that the, I mean, we, we, we just don't understand a lot of things. Even a great prophet who's having a vision from God himself didn't understand what was going on. Later, it's explained how the seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord, the the Spirit of the Lord. This is is a a metaphor for the church and for the Spirit of God. And uh, you can read about that at the end of the chapter. There is a a verse here, verse 6, which I actually 
have marked down in my weekly Bible study preparation worksheet. Every week, every week, I meditate on Zechariah chapter 4, 6 with regard to you. Let's read it. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. So how do we handle a big challenge? The temple's been in, uh, well, in ruins for a long time, but the temple has not been rebuilt after 15 years. There's a lot of opposition. They're facing a big challenge. How does God tell them to address this issue? It's not by might nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so you see happening here two approaches. One approach, this is the big idea, is letting it happen. And the second is making it happen. Just over the last month or so, I've been, uh, I've had a number of, of challenges. My challenges have been more challenges of opportunity. They're not, they're not things like health issues or, you know, calamities. But nevertheless, they, they've created a lot of pressure for me. I'm starting a new business, this Morley Leadership Center. And uh, I'm putting on the first seminar, and I'm trying to make, make the marketing decisions to get that filled up. <clears throat> uh, our ministry, Man in the Mirror, we've just finished the horizontal construction for the biggest project we've ever done. We've cleared the land, brought the utilities to the site. We've laid the foundation. We dug a deep hole because we want to build high. And, and now we, you know, on your construction projects, it seems like it takes forever and then one day you turn the corner and suddenly, boop, the building's up. And so we're, we're ready to do that, but I need, I need a lot. We, I, and I have promised the leaders of the Christian men's movement that this, this site, disciplemen.com, would be online by April 10th. And so over the next few weeks, I need to raise $600,000. Well, that's, that's a big challenge. Trust me. Trust me. And so I have all of that going on, and, and, and then uh, I had a, a guy cheat me on a car. It seems like I'm, I'm, I've had it with cars. <clears throat> I mean, I, I mean it. I'm, I'm done. I've had it. I'm done with cars. No more car stuff. Yeah, until the next one, right? <clears throat> And then I've got a new book that I'm, uh, is out to the publishers now, but it's all my other books have been Christian books. This book <clears throat> is a business book. It's called One Great Idea Can Change the World. And so it's a whole new way of, of uh, a whole new marketplace for me. So I've got, got a lot of things on my mind, right? And, um, and so I li I'm living by faith, but that doesn't relieve the pressure. You still feel the pressure. Right? It doesn't make any difference how much you know God. I mean, uh, trust me, when they, as Scott was talking about last week, when, when they take you to the lion's den, you know, you feel the pressure. Uh, even if you have faith that everything's going to turn out all right. And so, um, and so what, I, what I found was is that I felt like I needed to make something happen. I just got in this mud. Just, hey, I need to make it happen. And so I started, I felt myself pushing, uh, trying to force things to happen. You know, time. Hey, I don't have time for this. You've got to make it happen. You've got to perform. And the more I did that, the more miserable I, I was getting. And uh, uh, I think it was maybe about 10 days ago, I had, I had this, this epiphany. You know, uh, when I say, Lord, whatever it takes for me to be in right relationship with you and and, I, and when I come humbly to the foot of the cross so that I can negotiate the terms of a full surrender of my life to your lordship, this, this is what it is. It's the difference between letting it happen versus making it happen. That's the difference in our lives when we face the big challenge. It's, it's really, how are, you going to, how are you going to deal with it? This is it. You've got two choices. It's the difference between letting it happen versus making it happen. Letting it happen. 
is, is how, how do we practice surrender? It's all about letting it happen. Making it happen is force, strength. Making it happen is controlling the outcomes. Making it happen is frustration, disappointment, anger, bitterness. My wife was talking to someone recently who has now been divorced for some 15 years. And the person is still consumed with their ex-marital partner. Just consumed. That person controls this, the, the ex-partner controls this person's life. Just the bitterness. And because this person wants to control, still wants to control the outcome. Still wants to. Has not really surrendered. He's trying to make it happen. Won't just let it happen. Okay, you've got to let it happen. Some things you, you can have an impact on, but some things you just have to let happen. Letting it happen, if making it happen is, is force or might or power or strength, letting it happen is the spirit. What does the text say? It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Letting it happen is the Holy Spirit. And this, this metaphor <clears throat> here in the vision, uh, the, the oil, the bowl, uh, the, the olive oil is always to be taken as a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Letting it happen is the Holy Spirit. That's what, that's what letting it happen is all about. It's letting it happen is, is the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's love, it's joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all the other things. That's what letting it happen is. If you're not feeling it, if you're not feeling it, you might be, and you're, if you're in the middle of a challenge, I'm not talking about the pressure, okay? I feel the pressure. But I'm also feeling love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. Letting it happen, making it happen is forcing the outcome, pushing the issue. Letting it happen is waiting on the Lord. It's waiting on the Lord. Do this with me. Everybody... I want you to make two fists. And now I want you to clinch as hard as you can, or almost as hard as you can. <clears throat> but clinch them real good. Okay, now I want you to tighten, tighten the muscles in your neck. Tighten them. Tighten them up. All right, now I want you to grit your teeth. Okay, hold it, hold it. Oh, didn't it feel good? That's making it happen. That's making it happen. Okay? Now, I want everybody to do this. I want everybody to take a deep breath. Hold it. Exhale slowly. Let's do this again. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Slowly exhale. Ooh, one more time. Deep breath. Hold it. Okay, exhale slowly. Whew. That's letting it happen. That's the difference between making it happen and letting it happen. It's a huge difference. So when we say, Lord, whatever it takes for me to be in right relationship with you, do it! It's the difference between letting it happen versus making it happen. That's the big idea today. Letting it happen versus making it happen. Lord, I must each day come humbly to the foot of the cross and there negotiate the terms of a full surrender of my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Great idea, but how do you practice it? This is how you practice it. This is, this is the implementation plan for surrender. Letting it happen versus making it happen. Make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? All right. What is it? Letting it happen. Making it happen. What is it? 
Well, it, you might think of it as the big challenge that you're facing. But I think there's, a, there, there's an even better answer, and that's a good answer, but I think there's an even potentially better answer. The it is the good, pleasing, perfect will of our Lord and Savior. God's will. Letting it happen is God's will. I want to let it happen. I don't want to make God's will happen. Letting it happen is God's will. I was uh, one of the men I was talking to this week who has a big deal who's kind of going sideways. Uh, I happened to be in an email correspondence with him on something else. And so uh, I knew he, he had this closing mm, uh, about two weeks ago. So on the, on the morning I, I, I sent him, I know this is your big day. And uh, here's, the, here's the thought for the day, letting it happen, you know, let it happen versus make it happen. Well, guess what? It didn't happen. <laughs> and it still hasn't happened. But he is absolutely resolute that whatever the outcome is, that he is going to do everything in his power to do the work with excellence, but then he is going to not do that extra little bit to try to make it happen. He's going to instead let it happen. He is convinced that it is what he wants. Not the deal. God's will. That's what he wants. He wants it. He really wants it. And that is, that in, in trying to implement surrender, this is one of the key ingredients. Probably, probably you can't get to surrender if you don't really get to this. If you don't want it, if it isn't good enough, then you probably will never get to surrender. Make sense? Yeah. You got to get to it before you can get to surrender, to wanting it, to wanting God's will. Do you really want God's will? Of course you do. Just that sometimes along the way we get confused and, and uh, want to help him. I don't even know where I am on the outline now. Okay. How is letting it happen different from making it happen? We've covered that. Down here, what is our part and what is God's part in letting it happen? Okay? Our part. What is our part? And letting it happen. I've been having an interesting conversation for about a month with a man from this table about this. And the bottom line is, we, he and I are really in agreement, complete agreement on this, is that, is that I am responsible to perform. I am responsible to do my work with excellence. I am responsible. The, the concern this man has had is that there's this tendency in Christendom for, for, for a businessman who's, you know, he's by the book. And then you get over here into the Christian world and, and, and something doesn't happen that's supposed to happen. And the tendency is to say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You know, it must be God's will. And, and meanwhile, it, the person's been sloppy, irresponsible, uh, unaccountable, uh, hasn't done the work with excellence, but, oh, well, well, that's okay. You know, God will work it out. Well, baloney, God will work it out. God, how is God going to work with sloppiness or lack of excellence or lack of professionalism or not giving something your very best? Why would God want to bless that? So, <laughs> don't, uh, don't, for letting it happen, don't ever think that letting it happen means you can be sloppy. Letting it happen means that you're going to give this 100% of your robust best to make it happen. To let God make it happen. So I was talking with another businessman last week, and we were on the same subject. And he said, you know, I caught my God. The age of 35 years, I caught my God. Money was my God. And I was so disillusioned. 
I had to go into therapy. Sold my business, went into therapy. Just totally wiped me out. Totally wiped me out. And so he now has come back, and he said this. He said, you know, it's interesting. My problem is, is that, that I get compulsive. You know, I start out, putting words in his mouth now, I start out letting it happen. But then I'm compulsive, and I start pushing too hard, and I try to make it happen. And he said this. He said, you know, the, the problem with this is that it's, it's, it's 80-20. It's that you do have to, you do have to do 80%. You do have to do 80%. And then God does the, the last 20%. But if you, if you, the problem is, is that once you, you, you get on a roll and you get to 80% and it's not happening, you know, you, you say, well, if I just, I can see all I need to do is just push here. You know, a lot of times you break your screwdriver when you push there. But if I just push there, I can make it happen. Instead of waiting on the Lord and letting it happen. So, our part really is to give the 80%, to, which is the best we've got. And then it's to let God's part be to supply the Spirit, to supply the power. It's not by our force or strength, it's by the Spirit. God's part. God does His best work when I do my best work. So letting it happen is not about being sloppy. God does his best work when I do my best work. And God does his best work when I am weak. Sometimes my best work isn't, isn't very much. It's the best I have, but it's still very, very weak. God does his best week, work when I, weak or strong, am doing the best that I can. Our part is letting it happen. God's part is making it happen. Let us never be confused about who is letting and who is making. The big idea today, letting it happen versus making it happen. This is how you implement surrender. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. And just every time we turn to a new page, there you are, ready with something great to tell us. <laughs> Lord, uh, there are many of us th today who face big challenges. Um, some of them are career-threatening, health-threatening, relationship-threatening. Some of them are, uh, won't make any difference if they don't work out, but they're still very important to us. Some of them, though, will uh, completely turn our lives upside down. And... Lord, we, we have already declared ourselves here as men who want to lead surrendered lives. And we also know that it's, we find it difficult to implement it. So, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, for the men for whom this would be appropriate, that you would allow this, this idea of, of letting it happen versus making it happen kind of be burned into our brains and that you would recall it along with this text, that it's not by force or might, but by your spirit, that it gets done. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.